Throughout British or European rule, most African countries got a railway. More often than not, it was built to tap the riches of the inner country and bring it back to the coast for export and exploitation. I'd like to cover a good handful of these railways, as a lot of them have quite interesting histories, but this time, we're covering one of the most famous, for all the right and wrong reasons, the Uganda Railway, and later through combination with other railways in the area, the East African Railway. In British East Africa in the mid-1800s, there was not a railway. An official trail connected the coast of Mombasa with Buzia, near the shores of Lake Victoria. Known as the mckinnon Sclater Road, it was completed in 1890, but by no means was it for the faint of heart, being built to a point ox carts could barely get through. It wasn't the most ethical way, either. Slaves would be bought to carry cargo through to the coast, something that was agreed needed to end during the 1890 Brussels Congress Act. A railway would logically bring an end to this, making the road redundant. The British also wanted a better hold on the regions around Lake Victoria, and in 1891, Captain James MacDonald took a survey crew from Mombasa and headed into the bush, their surveying toward the lakes lasting until the fall of 1892. Construction began in Mombasa in 1896, the railway dubbed the Uganda Railway, as Uganda was its ultimate destination. From the start of construction, those back home in England thought little of this railway across Africa for seemingly no reason. It was costing quite a lot of money to construct, and from this waste of money, as some perceived, came a nickname. The new and still uncompleted Uganda Railway, because of one British politician's thoughts on the railway being a gigantic folly, became the Lunatic Line. It certainly wasn't easy going for those brought in to construct the railway, most of which had come from India. 2,493 of them would die pushing the railway through, from disease and hostile wildlife. The worst coming to a head when the railway was constructing a bridge over the Savo River. Two lions started sneaking into camp at night and taking workers away. Modern estimates of how many killed by them is at least 35, though reports of the time said at least 135. And no one is quite sure why these two lions were drawn to human prey. It's still speculated to this day. Despite these issues, the Lunatic Line did reach Lake Victoria by 1901. Further branch lines and extensions were also built, and steamships were brought up piece by piece and reassembled for use on the lake. A big draw after completion of the railway was the wildlife. Many amazing animals roamed the bush along the line, and the railway quickly pitched itself as a safari adventure. Many came to see the animals, but many more came to take them home as prized game, some even shooting their crack shot from a special bench on the front of the locomotives on specifically run hunting trains. In 1929, the railway became the Kenya and Uganda Railways and Harbors Company, as the railway also had control over steamships on Lake Victoria and all harbors it connected to. The railway also continued to expand, building a branch line to Mount Kenya and extending the main line to connect Kampala, the country's largest city only being connected up to 1931 by a branch line. In 1948, the newly formed East African High Commission was put in charge of the then still British administered Kenya, Uganda, and Tanganyika, later Tanzania after its combining with Zanzibar. The EAHC was to provide common services to the country, and one of these services was rail. The same year, the EAHC merged the Kenya and Uganda Railways and Harbors Company with the neighboring Tanganyika Railway, which connected the coast at Dar es Salaam with Lake Victoria on the Tanganyika side, along with Lake Tanganyika. The combined network became known as the East African Railway and Harbors Corporation. The EAR inherited an eclectic mix of motive power, ranging from various types of 282 on the Tanganyika system to a sizable batch of 480s on the Kenya system. 480s were a very popular design in Africa, and EARs will not be the last we see. Despite the sheer number of classes, Tanganyika Railway engines tended to stay in Tanganyika, while Kenya-Uganda engines tended to stay in Kenya, aside from some 480 swapping. East African Railways, like many new companies, also had a flashy new livery, a bright maroon with gold trim, a very sharp look for their fleet of steam locomotives. The newly combined system also ordered several batches of new locomotives, starting with the 29 class, 282 Mikados from North British that were based on the river class 282 supplied to the Nigerian Railways. On the EAR, these engines were known as the Tribals, as all engines were named after various tribes
tribes in Kenya and Uganda. Following these were the 30 and 31 class, both 284 tender engines. The 30 class, with their larger tenders, spent all their lives in Tanganyika slash Tanzania, with the exception of one. Number 3020, Nyaturu, was in Nairobi for overhaul when the East African Railways was split up, leaving it as property of Kenya Railways. The 31 class were just 30 class engines with smaller tenders for branch line work, and were used system wide in both countries for this purpose. As with the 29s, both the 30s and 31s were named after local tribes. The strangest East African Railways purchase were several ex Indian Railways YG 282s for Tanganyika. These engines were purchased in the 70s to replace old second hand US ATC S118 282 Mikados, down to the point that they were given the same class number. Steam didn't last much longer than the end of the 70s, though, so these oddballs too were retired. A lot sooner than their brothers back in India, some of which lasted into the new millennium. In the mid-1950s, the EAR was keen to purchase a more powerful locomotive for working heavy tonnage from Mombasa to Nairobi. The railway already favored Garrett's, like most African railways, and while their sizable fleet of 482 plus 284s and 484 plus 484s were good, they wanted more. Bayer Peacock was able to deliver, outshopping the first 59 class Garrett in 1955. These Monster 482 plus 284s were regarded as the largest meter gauge steam locomotives to ever be built, and were just what EAR needed to lift heavy trains up the 1.5% grades from Mombasa, where these locomotives held range from their constructions until finally displaced by diesels in the late 70s. Fittingly, all the 59 class were named after mountains in Africa, except for the last engine built, 5934 which was named after the Benengai Crater. All EAR steam was built or rebuilt to modern specs, all were oil-fired, and nearly all were built with or acquired diesel ejectors for better performance. In the 1950s and 60s, the EAR was a very modern-looking railway despite the predominantly steam roster. Engines were still being overhauled, all re-entering service in a fresh coat of maroon, and the majority of engines were kept in starshine condition. The fortunes of the railroad were good too, easily handling the majority of traffic due to roads that were close to impassable. It wasn't uncommon for a train to Nairobi to have a load of cars aboard, as it was easier to just ship cars by rail than even attempt to drive them there. Copper deposits in Uganda also brought vast profits streaming in. It truly was a golden era. Like most modern railways, the EAR invested in diesel traction. As a company with British ties, this meant British traction, a near monopoly on it, in fact. This is something we'll see with other colonial railways, and in some ways is what made steam last longer. By 1960, the EAR had several not very successful diesel shunters, and some mildly successful mainline diesels from the likes of North British, English Electric, and other British marks. None of the mainline diesels had the oomph to compare to the mighty 59 class, even when the British monopoly was broken and the Montreal Locomotive Works was able to provide larger and more powerful diesels, which were able to displace smaller Garrett's on the roster. The 59 still reigned. 1977 marked the end of East African railways as a whole. Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda had been decolonized in the 60s, and the railway split up between the three countries. Steam went in Tanzania first, as all steam maintenance had been done in Kenya, but steam clung on in Kenya for a while longer. The 59s held down dominance for another year or so until the new Class 93, the stalwart GE export and ubiquitous U26C, arrived. Smaller and not near as reliable Henschel units were also delivered around the same time, which spelled the end for smaller classes of engine. Steam seeing its end around Nairobi between 1979 and 1981, as several engines up to and including 159 were used for shunting work, whilst teething troubles were sorted on a not very stellar batch of Hunslet shunters. By 1982, steam was done on the entire East African Railways network. As time passed, investment in the railway was at a minimum, and not much was done, to the point only about 30% of the road was functional. Road infrastructure was greatly improved as the decades ticked by, and this didn't help things. During this time, however, steam did see a bit of a revival. 59 Class 5919, Mount Gelai, was returned to steam, along with the before-mentioned Class 30, number 3020, and one of the 24 Class 480s. Mount Gelai made two excursions to Mombasa and back on her old stomping ground before being restricted to only use around Nairobi, with the other two engines doing little trips out of Nairobi when possible. Unfortunately, lack of funding ended these excursions, and all three engines now sit in the Nairobi Motive Power Depot waiting for funding or a chance to run again. The biggest investment for the Kenya Railway on the old Lunatic line was in 2017. A brand new standard gauge line from Mombasa to Kenya was opened. Funded by Chinese investment, it follows the original meter gauge line, but rides upon high trusses on embankments to make for a faster run with less curves, and it has completely displaced the original mainline. 
The Mombasa to Nairobi standard gauge railway is still fairly new and is a modern marvel. The meter gauge still runs east from Nairobi to Uganda, where connections are made with the Uganda Railway, but standard gauge extensions to the new system have already been discussed. For a railway originally intended just to make a simple connection across a country, the history really is impressive, from man-eating lions, visits from Teddy Roosevelt on shooting safaris, to massive garrets and a high-speed standard gauge mainline to the future. The lunatic line really has proved all those skeptics wrong. Thank you for watching! I lightly glazed over the more upsetting history around this railway's forming and the decolonization era. I've put links in the description that can cover these in more depth than I can, as neither of these are parts of history that should be buried. Once again, thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video.